Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 30 of Advanced Linear Algebra. In this class, we're going to introduce the final family of matrices that we're going to see in this class, okay? And these matrices are called positive semi-definite. And the intuition to keep in the back of your mind throughout basically all of this week is the idea that positive semi-definite matrices, they're sort of like the matrix version of numbers that are bigger than or equal to zero, okay? So we'll see a couple ways of pinning down that idea as we go through this week, um, but that's the idea, okay? Positive semi-definite means roughly it's a matrix that's bigger than or equal to zero. It's sort of positive in a sense. Okay, so here's the precise definition though. Okay, so what it is is, well, first off, you've got to be working over the field of real or complex numbers. Okay, if you're working over a more exotic field, this isn't going to work. Okay, and also you've got to be working with a Hermitian matrix. Okay, so it has to, the matrix has to equal its own conjugate transpose. Okay, well, under those situations, we say that a matrix is positive semi-definite, or PSD for short, if V star AV is always bigger than or equal to zero, no matter what vector V, no matter what column vector V, you choose to fill in those two slots, okay? And we say that a matrix is positive definite, or PD for short, if that inequality is strict whenever it could be strict, in particular, whenever V is not the zero vector. Of course, if V is the zero vector, you're gonna get zero over here on the left. But if that inequality is strict for all other vectors, then we say that's actually positive definite, okay? And positive definite matrices, they go one step further. They're, they're sort of the version, uh, the matrix version of matrices that are, you know, bigger than zero, okay? It's not just bigger than or equal to zero, but actually bigger than zero. That's the idea here, okay? But this intuition, be a little bit careful with it, okay? Because our intuition for how matrices behave does not come from what their entries look like, okay? Keep that in mind. So for example, we're gonna go through a quick little example here. We're gonna show that this matrix A here, we're gonna show that it is positive semi-definite, even though it has negative entries. And we're gonna show that this matrix B here is not positive semi-definite, even though all of its entries are positive, okay? So get your intuition sort of from what a matrix does as a linear transformation, not from what its entries look like. All right, so let's go through this example here. Let's let's go through this matrix A in particular first, okay? So we're gonna show that A, this matrix A, is positive semi-definite, okay? And the way that we're gonna do that is just directly from the definition. To show that it's positive semi-definite, we have to show that V star AV is bigger than or equal to zero, no matter what vector V I choose, okay? So that's all I'm doing down here is I've just plugged in an arbitrary vector V on the left and right hand slots, okay? And now I'm just gonna do matrix multiplication and I'm gonna expand that out. And when I do that, I'm starting off with the rightmost multiplication and that gets me this column vector. And now, now I do the next matrix multiplication, okay? So row vector times column vector, well, that's just the dot product, right? So it's this vector dotted with this vector, and I get this number here, okay? And at first, maybe that doesn't look like it's always bigger than or equal to zero, but if you're sort of clever, you can factor that. It turns out that equals the magnitude or absolute value of V1 minus V2 all squared, right? Okay, the way to convince yourself of this is take this number V1 minus V2 and multiply it by its own complex conjugate, okay? And you'll get exactly this expression over here on the left. So it's easier to go backwards, right? Okay, and this, of course, this is bigger than or equal to zero, right? You're taking a bigger than or equal to zero number and you're squaring it still bigger than or equal to zero, right? Absolute values or magnitudes, they're always bigger than or equal to zero. So yeah, this quantity is always bigger than or equal to zero, so we're done. That matrix A is positive semi-definite. Okay, on the other hand, the matrix B is not positive semi-definite, okay? So how do we convince ourselves of that? Well, to show something is not positive semi-definite, it's actually easier, right? To show something is positive semi-definite, you have to show that something holds for every vector B. But to show that a matrix is not positive semi-definite, you just have to find one particular vector for which, you know, you get a negative number out of that V star BV, okay? So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna pick a particular vector, and if we get a quantity that is less than zero, then hey, we're done. We know we're not positive semi-definite. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're computing V star BV for this particular vector V, just because, I mean, I cleverly chose it ahead of time. I know that it's gonna work for me. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about how to find a vector that works later on, maybe. Okay, I mean, like there's certainly some choices of vector V that make this quantity bigger than zero, but we just need to find one counterexample. We need to find one example that gets us something smaller, smaller than zero. All right, so again, just do matrix multiplications, okay? So if we do this product on the right, we get the column vector minus one, one, and then we do the next product, and you just get minus two, right? You get a minus one from the product of the first two terms, and then you get another minus one from the product of the next two terms. And the point there is that minus two, yeah, it's less than zero, okay? So B is not positive semi-definite because this quantity, it's not always bigger than or equal to zero.
Okay, so what we're going to do in this class is we're going to come up with some easier methods of determining whether or not a matrix is positive semi-definite. Okay, and to maybe drive home a point that I made a little bit earlier, um, let's talk about one by one matrices. If your matrix is one by one, in other words, you can just think of it as a scalar or a number, then it turns out that matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if it's bigger than or equal to zero, right? And for a number, you can talk about being bigger than or equal to zero. Okay. And if it is a number, well, yeah, positive semi-definiteness really is the same as non-negativity. Okay, and I've highlighted the S and the underbar here uh, because those sort of go together. Positive semi-definite corresponds to bigger than or equal to zero, whereas positive definiteness, if you omit the S here, positive definiteness corresponds to strictly bigger than zero. So you omit, omit the, the underbar there. Okay, but it just gives us a way of generalizing that idea or that concept to matrices that are larger than one by one. Okay, so how can we make it easier to determine whether or not a matrix is, is positive semi-definite or positive definite? Okay, and here's our big beast of a theorem. Just like unitary matrices have a whole bunch of characterizations and normal matrices have a whole bunch of characterizations, well, positive semi-definite and positive definite matrices have a whole bunch of characterizations as well. So let's go through some of them, okay? These are not all of them, but these are the ones that we're gonna make use of in this course. All right, so suppose that you're in your standard setup for positive semi-definiteness. So you need two things. You need to either be working over the real or complex numbers, and you need to be working with a Hermitian matrix. Then all of the following things are equivalent. So you can work with whichever one of them you like best, okay? First thing is, well, A is positive semi-definite or definite, okay? So I'm sort of combining two theorems in one here, okay? So the way to read this theorem is you can read it as, well, I'm gonna include all of the orange pieces of text, and forget about all of the blue pieces of text, okay? Or forget about all of the orange pieces of text and include all of the blue pieces of text, okay? So it's just a way of writing down a characterization of positive semi-definite matrices and a characterization of positive definite matrices all at the same time, okay? The characterizations of positive semi-definiteness, well, they're written in orange, and the characterization of positive definiteness are written in blue. All right, so a matrix is positive, semi-definite or definite, if and only if all of the eigenvalues of that matrix are non-negative or strictly positive, okay? So positive semi-definite, if and only if the eigenvalues are all bigger than or equal to zero, and positive definite, if and only if all of the eigenvalues are strictly positive, strictly bigger than zero, okay? Equivalently, a matrix is positive, semi-definite or definite, if and only if there exists some di real diagonal matrix with non-negative or strictly positive diagonal entries and a unitary matrix such that A equals U D U star. Okay, so all this is, this is a spectral decomposition, right? This is something that we learned about last week. So here's a spectral decomposition of A, and we're just adding one extra restriction to it. We're saying that a matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if it has a spectral decomposition where the diagonal matrix D has non-negative diagonal entries. Or, a matrix is positive definite if and only if it has a spectral decomposition where the diagonal matrix D has strictly positive diagonal entries. All right, and last but not least, A is positive semi-definite if and only if there exists some matrix B such that A equals B star B, okay? Or a matrix is positive definite if and only if there exists an invertible matrix B such that A equals B star B, okay? So if positive semi-definite but not positive definite would mean that you'd be able to find some non-invertible matrix such that this happens, but not an invertible one. Okay, so the, the sort of flavor with all of these characterizations is that, yeah, the thing, it's bigger than or equal to zero, whatever that means for a matrix. And if it's definite, then it's sort of strictly bigger than zero. Again, whatever that means for a matrix. All right, so let's go through the proof here. We're gonna prove this theorem, and the way that we're gonna prove it is we're gonna prove the chain of, uh, of implications A implies B, implies C, implies D, implies A, and then it sort of circles around and all of them apply each other. Okay, unfortunately, none of these are actually gonna be very terrible to go through, okay? So we go through sort of carefully here. Each of them just follows in a line or two. So let's start off with, let's show, let's show that property A implies property B. Okay, so let, let's show that positive semi-definiteness implies that all of the eigenvalues of A are bigger than or equal to zero. They're all non-negative. All right, so if A is positive semi-definite, let's just give a name to the eigenvalue, lambda, that we're talking about, and it's got some corresponding eigenvector V. Okay, well, because A is positive semi-definite, we know that V star AV is bigger than or equal to zero, or I've, I've written the equal part here in a different color because the argument's slightly different if it's positive definite, okay? You omit the S and you omit the un underbar, but everything else goes through the same. 
All right, but anyway, if it's positive semi-definite, then this quantity is bigger than or equal to zero. But, I mean, V is an eigenvector of A, so we can sort of simplify this AV here a little bit, and let's do that. AV just becomes lambda V, because that's an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. Okay, and then this simplifies further again, because lambda, that's a scalar, I can pull it out front, and if I do that, now I just get lambda times V star V, so that's all I'm left with there. Okay, and now I can rewrite this in a little bit of a different way. Here I've got lambda times, well, what is this? What is V star V? Well, another way of writing that would be V dotted with V, or equivalently, that's the norm of V squared, right? That's the norm induced by the dot product. All right, so what's this tell us? This tells us that lambda norm of V squared is bigger than or equal to zero. Well, I know that the norm of V squared is bigger than or equal to zero. So the only way that the product of these two things can also be bigger than or equal to zero is if lambda itself is also bigger than or equal to zero, right? Divide both sides by this length of V squared. All right, so yeah, so we conclude that, yeah, lambda does have to be bigger than or equal to zero. And if you're working with positive definiteness instead of positive semi-definiteness, all you do is you erase the underbar there and you erase the underbar there and the argument still goes through fine. All right, so that's A implies B. We've shown that if it's positive semi-definite, eigenvalues are bigger than or equal to zero. Next up, let's show that B implies C. Let's show that if all of the eigenvalues are non-negative, then you can do this decomposition where D has all of its entries non-negative. Okay, and actually there's sort of nothing to do here. This is what we talked about last week. I'm just going to say, hey, this follows immediately from the spectral decomposition because it does, right? I mean, this is just the spectral decomposition. Because A is Hermitian, it has a spectral decomposition. Furthermore, we talked about how last week, well, if it's Hermitian, it's got real eigenvalues, so I can choose D to have real entries, right? The entries along the diagonal of D are the eigenvalues of A. Okay, and furthermore, because the eigenvalues of A are non-negative, well, again, the diagonal entries of D are going to be non-negative because those are the eigenvalues. All right, so property C follows basically immediately from property B once we're comfortable with the spectral decomposition. So let's go on to property C implying property D. Let's show that if we have this spectral decomposition, then we can find this matrix B such that A equals B star B. All right, so that's what we're going to do next. Let's show that property C implies property D. All right, so here's the setup. Suppose that you've got a spectral decomposition, and furthermore, I'm assuming that the entries along the diagonal of D are bigger than or equal to zero for positive semi-definiteness, or strictly bigger than zero for positive definiteness. Okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to let B be this matrix here, and we're going to just show that B this works. You know, B star B does equal A if I choose B in this way. Okay, and sort of the intuition here, what I'm doing is I'm roughly choosing B to be like a square root of the matrix A, right? This is sort of half of this spectral decomposition over here. I've just sort of taken like the right half of the spectral decomposition. I've taken the U star and a square root of D. And by square root of D, all I mean here is the entry-wise square root of D, right? D is diagonal. It's got some non-negative entries on along its diagonal. Just take the square roots of those non-negative entries and keep it diagonal. That, that'll get you root D here. Okay, so... Let's show that this matrix B actually works. Let's show that it does what we want it to. Okay, well, B star B, just compute it, plug in this formula for B here, and what do you get? Well, you get this star this, and I just do your matrix multiplication and adjoint rules and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this bracket over here, you apply the star to each term and swap the order of multiplication, so you end up with a U double star, which is just U over on the left, then root D star times root D times U star. And then, well, because these are diagonal matrices with real numbers along their diagonals, this star isn't actually doing anything, right? It's conjugate transposing a real diagonal matrix. Who cares? It's not doing anything. So this is just root D times root D, which is just D itself. So we're just left with U times D times U star, which that's just A, right? We started off with the spectral decomposition and we just recovered it here. So that just equals A. And that's what we wanted. We got B star B equals A. All right, so we're almost done here. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, there's one more note I want to make about make about this particular note. Uh, so here, this is the argument that we just did. That was the argument for positive semi-definiteness. We need a little bit more care, not too much more if it's positive definite. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to scroll back up to the statement of the theorem. I'm going to look now at the blue text, okay? So we want to show that C, we want to show that C implies D for the blue text as well. So we want to show that D has strictly positive diagonal entries, not just not non-negative, but strictly positive diagonal entries. Then we can find, can find an invertible matrix B that works. All right? And the way to do that is you just notice that, okay, if the diagonal entries of D are strictly positive, then hey, so are the diagonal entries of root D, right? If you take square root of a strictly positive number, it's still strictly positive, okay? 
Well, a diagonal matrix is invertible if and only if its diagonal entries are non-zero. So if D has non-zero uh, entries, then so does root D. So root D here is invertible, okay? Well, if root D is invertible, and we know that U star is invertible because it's a unitary matrix, here we've got a product of two invertible matrices. And there's a theorem from last class that says, well, when you, when you multiply together two invertible matrices, you get an invertible matrix. So B must be invertible in that case as well. So it's the same matrix that we used in the positive semi-definite case. It's just, it turns out to be invertible as long as the diagonal entries of D are all strictly bigger than zero. All right, so that does it for C implies D. Last one we've got to do is we've got to do D implies A. So we've got to show that, hey, if we can find a matrix B that decomposes A in this way, sorry, a matrix B that decomposes A in this way, then A is positive, semi-definite, or definite. All right, so how do we do that? Well, fortunately, this one's fairly quick, too. It follows all just quickly from the definitions, okay? So if A equals B star B, then we have to show that V star AV is always bigger than or equal to zero. That's our goal. We want to show it's positive, semi-definite. Well, just sub in this formula for A. So now it's V star B star B V. And now this, we're just going to uh, sort of combine these two conjugate transpose terms into one conjugate transpose term, right? I mean, we just sort of factored it out here. And be careful when you do that, the order of multiplication swaps. So the V star B star becomes B V all star. Okay. And then notice that, hey, I've got B V times B V star, well, something times its own conjugate transpose, you know, column vector times, you know, the corresponding row vector on the left, that's just the dot product with itself. Another way to write this is B V dotted with B V, or in other words, same trick that we used earlier, this is just the norm of B V all squared. Okay, so because it's the norm of something squared, it's bigger than or equal to zero, and then you're done. Okay, that's, that's D implies A, sort of in the positive semi-definite case. So again, we have a little bit of an extra argument that we gotta do in the positive definite case. So, in the positive definite case, the extra assumption that we have to work with in, pro in property D is that we're working with an invertible matrix B, not just any old matrix B, but an invertible one. We wanna get positive definiteness out of that. We've already got positive semi-definiteness. All right, well, if B is invertible, then here's the extra fact that makes it work. If B is invertible, then we know that B times V is never equal to the zero vector unless V itself is the zero vector, okay? If you go back to introductory linear algebra, we had this laundry list of characterizations of invertible matrices, and this was one of them, okay? Another way of phrasing this is the only solution to a linear system if the coefficient matrix is invertible is the zero vector, okay? So BV doesn't equal zero as long as V doesn't equal zero. And in particular, that means that the length of BV squared or the norm of BV squared also doesn't equal zero uh, unless V equals the zero vector. So you just trace things through and that's exactly what we wanted. We already know that V star AV is bigger than or equal to zero. And now we can say, well, actually it's not equal to, it's strictly bigger than zero as long as it's not the zero vector itself. All right, and that completes the proof, proof both for positive semi-definiteness and positive definiteness. Okay, so let's go through an example here of how to actually make use of this theorem. Let's show that this matrix, this is the same matrix from the first page of this week's notes. Let's show that it's positive semi-definite, like we already did, but not positive definite. And we're gonna do it in a bunch of different ways now, okay? And we're gonna see how some of these are a lot easier than using the definition like we did earlier. All right, so I'm gonna label these in the same way that these properties from the theorem are labeled, okay? So pro so I'm gonna show that this is positive semi-definite in four different ways. One way is gonna be using property A, one way is gonna be using property B, and so on for C and D, okay? So property A is just by the definition. Let's show that it's positive semi-definite by showing that uh, V star AV is always bigger than or equal to zero. And the way you do that is just what we did on the first page. We showed that V star AV equals, well, the absolute value or magnitude of V1 minus V2 all squared. And because that's some positive real number squared, yeah, still positive, okay? So yeah, A is positive semi-definite. We already did that argument, so we're sort of glossing over it. To show that it's not positive definite, we can just notice that, hey, there's something we can plug in here to make this equal to zero. Some non-zero V1 and V2s that we can plug in to make this equal to zero. In particular, if V1 equals V2, then that quantity equals zero, so it's not positive definite. For example, the vector one, one, or two, two, or seven, seven, any of those are gonna make V star AV equal to zero. All right, so it's positive semi-definite, but not positive definite. All right, property B, using property B of that theorem, the way you show positive semi-definiteness is you check the eigenvalues. 
If the eigenvalues are all bigger than or equal to zero, it's positive semi-definite. If they're not, it's not positive semi-definite. So let's find the eigenvalues here. All right, and the way you do that is you set determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero. All right, so let's just compute determinants of a minus lambda i, subtracting lambdas off the diagonal of a, and then computing the determinant product of the diagonal minus the product of the off diagonal gives me that expression there, one minus lambda squared minus one, and then just expand that out and factor, okay? So simplify and then factor, and what you're gonna get is lambda times lambda minus two, okay? So what that tells us about our eigenvalues is, well, setting this equal to zero, we see that our eigenvalues are gonna be zero or two. Those are our eigenvalues, zero and two. Okay, and then we just look at those and we ask ourselves, well, are those bigger than or equal to zero? Well, yeah, of course they are, right? Zero is bigger than or equal to zero, and two is bigger than or equal to zero. Yay, positive semi-definite. Woohoo! Okay, but not positive definite, right? Because they're not all strictly bigger than or equal. Sorry, they're not all strictly bigger than zero. We've got a zero eigenvalue, so it's not positive definite. All right. Let's go on to property C, okay? Property C says that our matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if we can find a spectral decomposition that has non-negative entries along the diagonal of that matrix D, okay? Well, how do, we construct, uh, how do we construct spectral decompositions? Well, we've already got the eigenvalues. We need the associated eigenvectors now, okay? To construct the unitary matrix U in the spectral decomposition. And in particular, we need orthonormal bases for the, the corresponding eigenspaces. Okay, and well, I've just done that calculation for you here. This is a calculation to do on your own. Okay, corresponding to lambda equals zero is this eigenvector, and corresponding to lambda equals two is this eigenvector, one minus one. Okay, and just rescaled so that has unit length so we can throw it into a uh, unitary matrix. Okay, and then the diagonal matrix D just has the eigenvalues along the diagonal, zero and two, and then the unitary matrix just has these eigenvectors as columns in the same order, okay? So one, one is its first column, and then one minus one is its second column, all scaled by the same one over root twos that we had over here on the left, okay? And if you just double check, compute u times d times u star, you're gonna find that, yeah, you get exactly that matrix A. So it is positive semi-definite because you can find a spectral decomposition of the, of the desired form. All right, and finally, using property D, okay, we have to show we have to show, if we want to show that a matrix is positive semi-definite using property D, we have to show that there is some matrix B such that B star B equals A, right? If we scroll back up to the statement of the theorem, we want to show that there's some matrix B such that B star B equals A. All right. Well, how do we construct the matrix B? Well, we're just going to sort of mimic what we did in the proof, okay? We're going to compute this matrix root of D times U star. Okay, where we just leech off of the spectral decomposition that we computed up, up, up above, okay? So I'm gonna take the root of D times U star, okay? And root of D, I just mean sort of the naive entry-wise way, okay? So it's just zero, 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 root two, still diagonal, still non-negative entries and along the diagonal, it's just the roots of the original non-negative entries, okay? And then here, this is just U star, which happens to equal U itself, but I did conjugate transpose it, okay? And now you multiply them together and you're just gonna get this matrix here. Okay, if you want to convince yourself that this really does work, just check, compute B star times B, and you'll see that, yeah, you get exactly that matrix A up above there, okay? So yeah, A, again, has to be positive semi-definite because you can decompose it as a matrix times its own conjugate transpose. All right, so that does it for today. Next class, we're gonna go on to larger matrices, okay? How do you check positive semi-definiteness for three by three in larger matrices? You can, of course, use that theorem that we had up above, but there are a couple other ways that are maybe a little bit more efficient. Uh, and we'll start looking at other properties of positive semi-definite matrices, like why we care about them in the first place. All right, so I will see you then.